All right, everyone, welcome back. Today we're gonna to take a look at a project uh, that's going to use LiDAR and blob tracking to create a touch reactive particle system. This project is going to end up looking something like this. So we have a touch reactive particle system where our touches can be either sources or attractors for our particles. Uh, and then we'll also be able to have a fully interactive kind of particles following the touch dynamic, um, in addition to several other things that will be optional as we're going through this. Um, now, the structure of this tutorial is going to be a little bit different. Um, this is going to be a pretty simple project. There's really just two components, and both of those components are things that uh, I've created before using uh, other tutorials. So I'm going to be leveraging the work that those tutorials have already went through. And the goal of this is going to be uh, setting up a full project kind of from scratch. So focusing on the infrastructure, focusing on making sure that our project files and file structure is in the right setup, <clears throat> and working on making sure that we are just getting ready for a full production setup uh, in a professional environment. So, with that said, uh, I'm going to take a break from this for the moment, and I'm going to pull up the two files uh, that I'm going to be using and get working on those to get them ready to bring in uh, to this full project. So, one quick note. Um, It's a little bit bright outside. So I want to make sure that I'm showing you guys the LiDAR uh, so that you can see the full interaction, but I do apologize that it is a little bit bright and it's not quite the best picture, um, but you should be able to see the interactions well enough. Okay, so this is one of the files. This is from the particle SOP tutorial. Uh, this is right where I left off at the end of that tutorial. Um, and actually, I'm just going to close this whole thing down. Uh, so this is one of the, the files that we'll be working with. And the other is going to be the LiDAR component uh, that I created as part of another tutorial. So that one I'm opening up right now. And it is here. So first things first, I'm just going to create two components uh, out of these two projects that I can then drop in to my new project. And then I'll start working on, on editing them there. So. This one is pretty easy. I'm just going to collapse this down and call it LiDAR. I'll worry about the parameters and other stuff like that later. I'm going to save this component. Uh, I'm going to create a new folder, and we'll call this LiDAR Particles Live. And then I'm going to create a folder within this folder. I'm going to call it Tox. And inside of this, I will save my LiDAR component. That's actually all I need from this file. So I will quit out of that. And I will do the same with this particle SOP component, uh, which I already have some nice parameters. So for that, I will simply save my component tox. I will find my live uh, LiDAR particles live folder. I'll jump in the tox and I will save it uh, right with our LiDAR. Then I will open up a new touch designer. And this new touch designer will be the basis for our project file. Here we go. Uh, it is new. So this is the, the template startup file that I use. Um, I'm actually going to 
get rid of all of this. So there's going to be nothing but the top level um, project one that Touch Designer auto populates. So all of this, I'm just gonna delete. So we have a completely fresh file. And then I'm going to save this file in the same place, my LiDAR particles live. And here I'll call this LiDAR particles. Very good. Uh, so now that we have this main folder set up, uh, we can drop in our components and start to get things wired together. So shift X uh, will allow you to add a component from this dialog. I'm gonna jump into the tox folder and I'm gonna open up my LiDAR component. Now I'm just gonna add in the particle SOP component too, uh, but we will Come back to this in a second. So first things first, I'm going to use this project one as my top level component that's going to hold my core parameters. So I'm going to give myself a called resolution. This will be an XY and I will default that to 1920 by 1080. Then I'm also going to give myself a pulse parameter. That pulse parameter will be a simple pulse. Um, and then one other thing that I'm going to do is just take this resolution and assign the height and width of my container based on that resolution. And then I'm gonna give it a name like LiDAR particles. I will then give it a global op shortcut of proj. And I think that should be about all that I need to do for this top level. Now in here, we're going to have these two components, uh, which will be our main effect. So I'm actually going to well, Yeah, I'm gonna collapse them down into this component and I will call this component gen. You know, I actually disagree, I, I take that back. Uh, I'm gonna leave these up here. And okay, so one other thing I think the best way to do this. And I'll add a container called controller. And this container called controller, uh, which I will give an operator, a global op shortcut of controller, um, this is going to be where the infrastructure that powers our project lives. So one thing that I'm gonna do is just drop in a keyboard in one and then a null, which I'll name pulse. And then uh, back on my project component, I'm just going to reference op dot controller dot op pulse k1 and this way 
I will now be able to pulse my entire network uh, by using my one key. Uh, and then all I'll do there is, all I need to do then to use that is just reference this pulse parameter uh, with anywhere that I want to reset. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit more work on our project infrastructure in a second, but for right now, I want to get these two components up and running. So first, let's jump into the LiDAR component and get this going. Now, the reason that we're not seeing anything, even though I have a LiDAR set up, is because this get LiDAR data um, or the C++ component is pointing to a path that doesn't exist. So because we are working with our uh, custom plugin and we're focusing on project infrastructure, one thing that we definitely want to do is add a folder to our project. This is going to be called bin. And inside of this folder is going to be where all of the Python libraries uh, plugins and just other external stuff that we need to use for our project is going to live. Um, so I'm going to go back to the uh, LiDAR tutorial folder, which is all uploaded on Patreon. Um, and I can drop a link in the description. And I'm just going to copy this SlamTech LiDAR master folder that has all of this good stuff in it. And I'm going to just paste that in the bin folder of our new uh, project directory. Now I'm going to go back to my C++ plugin and I'm going to reference the plugin file that is now in my directory. You'll see that we use a relative path now uh, in our plugin path which means that it's looking at the folder in the root directory called bin, and then going down from there to get to our plugin. We can also see that our data is working. Okay, cool. So I just added a little viewing window uh, so that we can see the LiDAR. And so now that that's working, we wanna see the LiDAR up on our screen. Um, so to do that, I'm going to add a, another container. I'm going to call this container perform. I'll jump inside this container. I'm going to add a window comp. I'm going to point this window operator to our Project. And then I will give us a texture that we will output to our project. And make sure that I turn off these other panels because we don't need them and they will mess things up and cool okay so it looks like our uh, perform window is pointed at our top level project which is working correctly um, I'm going to specify my monitor too because that's the projector that I have set up right now I'm going to set it to fill on the opening size, turn off borders, and then just for quality of life, I'm gonna give myself a key and allow myself to open a separate window with the three. And so now I press three and boom, I have my perform window working. Um, it's a little distorted right now, we'll fix that in just a second. And again, apologies for the washed out look. Um, but for illustration purposes, I think it's fine. Um, all right, so 
if I just wire my LiDAR directly in to my out, I believe, aha, something isn't working. Okay, so we can see that we do have our LiDAR, uh, we're getting some data and we're rendering, but something isn't quite working there. So at this point, it's probably good to start simply, um, I'm just gonna close this now. Uh, it is good to start customizing this component and turning it into something that we can use a little bit more practically. So first things first, I'm going to wire in this offset degrees and actually I wanna make sure that I'm binding these. So I'm going to bind that offset. Um, my camera is all messed up, so I'm going to delete a bunch of these parameters on my camera. And yeah, so you can see this a little bit. Um, Actually, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so what's going on there? Part is because this camera is all pivoted weirdly, but the other reason is because it's simply not zoomed out enough. Uh, so now we can see our entire room on the render, which you can see in the screen as well. Um, So from here, we can fine tune the offset degrees. We can open up our parent parameters. Um, and at this point, I normally start to go like this and just kind of see my data uh, to make sure that I understand the right orientation and all that stuff. So it looks like we're generally pointing up, uh, as you can see my my little stylus moving. And here, right about here, is our sensor. So this thing right there is our sensor. Um, so I need to rotate this just a little bit. Maybe like, that looks pretty straight. And now what I'm gonna do is reset all the parameters on this crop. and drag and drop them to my component. And I'm going to be doing binding because sometimes it's nice to be able to work on this from inside the component. And now we can simply Um, here, I'm going to do the top or the bottom and the right first because those are easiest. Um, so the bottom comes the whole way up to here. And then I will use maybe something more bright like a constant, just so that I can see the sides of the screen uh, up here in real world. And then I can use this to just position the left, and, or sorry, the right and the top, and then use my cropping to fine tune and really just dial in my bounds. So this will be the top here.
great. Uh, so I'll put my blurring and threshold from before on. We can see that my, uh, what do you call it? Um, the sensor itself is, is overlapping right there. So there are a couple ways to do this, but I'm actually just gonna use a rectangle, make it very small. And then I'm just gonna position this rectangle directly over my, whoops, can't do that yet. Uh, directly over my sensor dot here. And while not maybe the most robust solution, it's pretty fast. And then I'll just make it black and there we lose our sensor artifact. And now I can wire the LiDAR directly in. And now we can see that our tracking is working pretty nicely and we have good responsive engagement uh, from the LiDAR sensor. Now, that's pretty much all we have to do to be able to use the texture screen space LiDAR. Um, I'm just gonna shut off my viewers. But, we will need to do a little bit more than just screen space LiDAR um, to be able to use this the way that we want. So I'm gonna add another piece to this. And that is going to be blob tracking. So I'm gonna keep this. And then I'm just gonna add a blob track top right after the, the rectangle, which I will rename to remove sensor artifact so that it's more clear what's happening. And then I'm gonna drop these guys down into a base, which I will call blur and threshold. Easy. Okay, so my blob track, let's take a look at what's going on. We have one death, it's callbacks. I'm not gonna use the callbacks here, uh, but I am going to use this blob track dat. So we can see when I touch, uh, the data that we're getting here is UV, the height and width of the blob. Maybe if I view it, we can see, uh, it's probably kind of hard to see. A little easier. Um, we can see the height, the width, if it's active or not, whether it's revived. As you can see here, I'm tapping a bunch, but the ID is staying the same versus if I tap over here and back, the ID is changing because I'm changing location. Um, so the blob track CV algorithm is able to persist specific blobs if they happen at the same time. Uh, in the same space over a very small period of time, rather. And we can see that in the maximum move distance and the revival time, revival area distance parameters. We can include lost and expired if we want, but I don't really need to do that here. Um, a couple things to note. One, we want the blob tracking resolution to be as small as possible. Uh, so it's already pretty small at like 260 by 145 because of our crop, which is probably fine. Um, but if for whatever reason your resolution is higher than that, you may want to do something like add a solution, wherever that is, a resolution, and just... I don't know, potentially like limit the resolution to something like 200 by 100. And this way uh, we'll make sure that we have a very small res uh, blob tracking. 
can also tweak the minimum blob size and the maximum blob size as well as the maximum move distance. I found that it works pretty well for LiDAR if this minimum and maximum is a little bit smaller. And then the move distance, I'm going to increase just a little bit. Now, to get this data into a usable format, I'm going to use adapt chop. Let's say my first row is names, output one channel per column. And then I'm going to create a null and I'm going to call this blobs. Um, yes, now one other thing that you could do, uh, which I'm not going to do here, I don't think, because we don't really need it for this functionality, um, but you could then use this blob tracking dat as instances to render instances, and then you'll have uh, nicely instance blobs instead of working with the raw data uh, blurring and thresholding it. So both are helpful depending on what you're looking for. But uh, yeah, I'm not gonna do that blob rendering now. I'm also gonna add a global op shortcut to my LiDAR component. I'm gonna call it LiDAR. And that should set us up pretty well uh, to be able to work on adding some more fun functionality here. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, I'm going to now turn on my particle SOP component and start to twerk on getting this into the right format for the rest of our project. So the great thing about the resolution and actually I should have done that with my LiDAR component too. I'm gonna drag and drop um, a resolution parameter. And then I want my resolution to be set based on my uh, project resolution. And so I can do that by using the global operator shortcut proj that we assign and say op.proj.par.resolutionx and resolution y. Then I'm just going to one, I guess, reorder that and then copy and paste the expressions by drag and dropping that parameter uh, on this other one. Now I just also need to re-point uh, this reset parameter to our op.proj.par.pulse.eval. And now you can see pressing one uh, that I'm resetting my network. We'll wire this up into our output. And now we can start to see, uh, see things happening. Um, okay. So that has most of our stuff wired up. So now we can start to think about interactions and infrastructure more deeply. Before I go further on tweaking components and building out our functionality, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about workflow file structure. So one thing that's difficult when working with other people in Touch Designer is being able to collaborate on the same project file because working together on the same file, you run into version conflicts. Maybe I change something that isn't updated on the file that you're working on, and that creates problems down the road. Uh, so an interesting and helpful workflow to be able to remedy that a little bit is to use externalized components 
that are then pulled into a master project file. So this is a version of the process that I use to manage this. Um, and so here's what we will do. Um, the main idea is that we'll use these external tox parameters and we'll actually point them at the tox files that we've saved. So first I'm gonna resave both of my uh, tox files. Save component tox, resave both of these and make sure that the, the most recent version is updated. Then I'm gonna come in here I'm going to assign my external tox to the LiDAR tox that we have in there. And then I'm going to resave that tox uh, so that it's saved with the external reference. I'm going to do the same for my particle swap. And I'm going to resave that as well. Uh, oops, I will do that for my particle stop and then resave as well. So now, whenever this project file is opened, these two components are going to be loaded from this path. This is great because it means that you and I can both have this file open and be working on different components. And as long as we each save our components into the directory, then whenever we reopen this master project file, all of the changes are just automatically pulled in. And if you save something, let's say you're working on this particle stop and you save it now while I'm in the middle of working on the LiDAR component, I can just click here um, and re-init. And that's just gonna reload my particle stop uh, from this directory and pull in all the changes that you just made. So it's a really handy workflow and it's one that I use a lot when I'm working with others or on larger scale projects because even if you're still working just on your own, one really handy, uh, let's say, side effect of this workflow is that you can use GitHub or your favorite version control software to then version control this folder and just make a GitHub repo out of this. And then you can actually have version history for all of your tox files, which is also something that's pretty difficult to get in Touch Designer if you're making a bunch of changes uh, across a bunch of components. These can get messy pretty quick and it can be difficult to remember which backup uh, you were able to you know, do XYZ thing in. So if you make this a GitHub repo, and then just commit after you make major changes. You can also use version control functionality like branching and stuff like that in, yeah, whatever workflows you're used to. So that is why this externalization is a super helpful tool. However, there's a very important thing to know about uh, and be conscious of. If you save this project file with control S like I just did. Um, actually, I'm going to, I'm gonna make this obvious. Um, so I'll use my noise. I'm gonna just replace this LiDAR out with a noise and we'll see that right here. So I'm gonna save this project file again. We're at number two now. I will close it and I will reopen it. So now the file's reopened, and as you can see, our noise is not showing up here. And in fact, there is no noise at all that even exists in this component. And the reason for that is because we saved the project file, but we didn't save the component after we made a change. And so when I opened up the project file again, it pulled in the most recent LiDAR.tox file in this directory, which was old and didn't have our version saved, or our update saved rather. So 
you need to make sure that you are saving the components as you go, uh, in addition to saving the overall file. Otherwise, you're going to inevitably be like, ah, I made this huge, amazing update and got all this functionality, save my project like I was supposed to, and now it's all gone. Fuck. So uh, that is the caveat and something to be aware of, but uh, we can also do a little bit of Python work to remediate that. Um, so to build that Python functionality, uh, we are going to do the next part of kind of project setup and infrastructure, and that is add a project extension. So I'm going to call this LiDAR particle extension, I'm going to add it, and then I will edit it. Um, all right, here's my VS code. Here's my new extension. I'll get rid of all of that. I will get rid of all of this. Um, cool. So what we need to do, and I guess first the theory behind this, we are going to put all of our Python functionality into this extension, uh, which you will come to appreciate uh, as things grow in complexity. So this is gonna be best practice to follow. It's not gonna be terribly important for this specific use case because what we're doing isn't that complicated. Um, but again, the purpose of this tutorial is really to think about putting together a production ready project um, with all of the infrastructure support. So this is important. Uh, so what we can do is create a new function and call say uh, we'll call it save externalized tox and then we'll just pass self as an argument um, so first we're going to have to find all externalized tox components then we're going to basically just save each of them when the project is saved. Um, so first we can define a helper function called find external ops. And you'll notice this is lowercase. Lowercase means that you won't be able to call this function outside of the extension, um, but we will be able to call it inside of the extension. So that's the difference between a promoted uh, method here and a non-promoted method there, uh, the capitalized versus lowercase. So I will first uh, just comment and say function returns list of all externalized talks in the network. Okay. I'll say tox equals op dot project again using our global reference. Uh, find children, and then I'm going to have my type equals com. Now you can. Touch designer, find children. You can look up the uh, docs if you need to. The component class has a function called find children, or rather a method called find children that you can pass in a type. Uh, and so that it'll return a list of all the children of that operator of the passed in type. So that's what we're doing now to grab the all the comps. So this will find all comps in network. And then for externalized, we will use list comprehension. And we will basically just say uh, a tox counts as externalized if this external tox parameter, which is called external tox, is not blank. 
So we will say t for t in tox if t dot par dot external tox is not equal to blank. And this uh, empty string is just the blank. And then uh, we can just return our external. And that should return uh, a list of tops. So we'll find all comps with a path in the external tox parameter. So now we can find all externalized tox components by calling, we'll say, external equals self dot find external ops. Uh, and then once we have all of them for each of them, so for operator in external ops, we can just call op dot save. And then we can save it to the same path as uh, what is in the external tox parameter. Save tox in the same location as its externalized tox file. Save. And that's pretty easy. Uh, if you come back to our docs here, also you can see the save method, um, which does take in a file path. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is pass this off, um, make this extension a little bit bigger and more obvious. And then in my controller, I'm going to place an execute dat. I'm going to turn on project pre-save. And then in my project pre-save, I'm going to say op.proj.save externalized tox. Or yeah, save externalized tox. And now I'll get this back. And where are we? Uh, there we go. Okay, so these are both saved at 10 a.m., which is 14 minutes ago, my time. Um, now what I'm going to do is go in Touch Designer and simply press Control S. And you can see that both of these tox files are now updated and saved as of 1014, which is the time right now. That's super handy and definitely worth doing if you're gonna be using this externalization workflow because like I said, it's just going to happen that you forget uh, to save your talks. Uh, and then when you open up the project again, all of your hard work is gone. Um, all right. So now that we have our controller working a little bit, um, It's time to jump back into our particle shop and start making some changes now that we know that we can uh, externalize all of this on demand. Before we do that, I'm going to save my different components. 
Um, I'm going to give everything a global op shortcut before I do. So this is going to be called perform. I'm going to save that in my tox just like this. I'll externalize it. And then I will do the same to my controller. It's already saved. Or sorry, it already has a global op shortcut. So I'm just going to save it and then point this external tox at it. Now, we can see these all have different update times. I'm going to control S, come back, and now they all have the same update time. Um, and this is great. This means that nothing outside of, well, this means that each of the comp functionality inside of each of these components can be worked on individually. Um, and every time we open this project file, which in theory never really needs to be saved after right now, um, everything is going to be fully set up and ready to go. Uh, last bit of functionality um, or file structure, I'm going to save this extension. I'm going to save the extension in my project file folder. So I'm going to create another folder in my root. I'm going to call this dat. And then I'm going to call the file itself, LIDAR particle extension. Save that. And then point this file in at it. And click sync to file. Now, again, this will just let us do things like version control with our work, um, which is gonna be really handy. Last thing that we're gonna do, I actually wanna set up the GitHub repo, um, just so everybody has the ability to follow through uh, in case it's not something that you are used to. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to open Git Bash uh, in my project. directory and I uh, can I there we go make it a little bit bigger for everyone and then the other thing that I'll do is get my github up so I'm going to create a new repository and this will be lidar particles tutorial I'm going to make it private. Um, and that's it. I'm going to create this repository. Now I'm going to copy the URL, or actually, I'm going to copy this right here. And then I'm going to come over to my git bash. Come over to my git bash. Um, so we're in the top level. Oh, what have I done? Oh, man. Um, okay, <laughs> I will Actually, I'm going to go through the VS code route because that's easy. So I'm going to open a folder and I'm actually going to open my entire project folder right here. Just like that. I will click on this so that I can have my view down here. And then I'm going to open up a git bash. There we go. Much easier. So here I will type git in it. And then I will that will initialize my repository. And then I'm going to type git add period. That's going to add all the stuff in my repository. 
Uh, I'm gonna type git commit dash m and then in quotes I'm gonna put the message that's gonna be just initial. So that was my initial commit right now. You can see that I'm on the master branch. Um, and so now I need to add my remote. So I'm gonna take this URL again. I'm gonna type git remote add this URL. And then we can check and see if it was added uh, by checking this out. Um, so git remote v, that does not seem to have worked. Ah, I think I know why. I was supposed to type git remote add origin. And now, yes, we can see that by typing git remote uh, dash v, we can verify that our uh, remote is attached. And then we can push all of our stuff to remote uh, by using git push dash u origin and then my master branch. And I'll go back to my GitHub and refresh the page. And now we can see that, boom, I have a full GitHub repository that has all of my tox files. It has my master toe. It has my extension and it has all of my plugin stuff. So now that we have that GitHub fully working, uh, we can use that version control flow. Um, all right, so I appreciate you bearing with me. Now we are finally ready to get into the good stuff here. So first I'm going to go to my parameters and I'm just gonna knock this down to like 500 particles a second. I am then going to make sure that I'm shutting off all of my visualizers and I'm gonna turn off this point velocity coloration um, because right now we don't need it. And I think the white is easier to work with and it gives us a little bit of help on our frame rate. So if we look at our panel, what is happening right now with this component? If we click and hold with the mouse, then we're able to have uh, the particles follow our mouse. And if we don't click and hold, and we just click, then there are attractors that are added. Um, and so that's the functionality that we're working with. And this is all happening through the panel. Now, it seems like the mapping is kind of messed up, so we'll fix that. Um, and we need a way to reset, but this is definitely good bones to work with. And we will see that because it's all set up through the panel, this is actually gonna make it pretty easy for us to extend functionality. So I'm going to change this label to just interactivity. I'm going to add a select chop. And this is where using global op shortcuts is super helpful. So I'm just going to use op.lidar.op, uh, not out, but rather blobs. And this will give us a direct reference to the blob tracking output from our component. And we can see that it is working as I'm touching uh, the LiDAR zone. 
So I'm going to select channels, U, V, and active. I'm going to rename those channels to UV and then L select. And that is because L select is the uh, left select button on the mouse that we're currently using for our panel interaction. So right now we have, uh, we have the panel set up so that a right click will remove all of the attractors that are stored. That's great, that's fine, uh, but we want it to remove the attractors also in the case that there is uh, the reset pulse. So I'm going to drag this reset pulse onto my particle reset and that will let us use one to just reset the entire thing. Okay. That's good, but how do we get the touch interactivity? To do that, I'm going to use a chop execute and I'm going to define a new function. So let's think about what we want. This is our LiDAR. And this one is, whoops, L select. And this one is our mouse. So when I have my viewer up like this, okay, so we can see when I'm using the mouse what's happening. The left select, i.e. when it clicks, is used to add a point, and when it's held down, that's when we're following the surface attractor, uh, which is the circle centered around the mouse, or not centered, but will be. Um, and so that's what we need to emulate. We need to emulate a click that will add an attractor like this. And then we need to emulate a click and drag that will allow us to have the, the particles tracking our LiDAR. So, and this is again, the great thing about using the panel. I'm going to create a function and I'm gonna do it in my extension, but I'm going to call it here. So while my left select, well, actually, I guess it's when my left select from the LiDAR goes from off to on, that's when there's a click. So we will say if, channel dot name is equal to L select, then I'm going to again use my global op shortcut to call op dot project. Uh, and then I'm going to call a function from the extension or a method from the extension that we haven't created yet, and we'll go create it. Uh, so this will be uh, Simulate click mm. You know, actually, I don't think this goes in the project extension, I think. It probably should. Okay, so in our project extension, um, we can add this function and we'll call it 
simulate click. Self. Uh, so, what do we need? We need to define a few things. So, we'll say self.blobs is going to be equal to our op.lidar.op blobs. And then in simulate click, which is capitalized because we want to promote it, uh, we can do this. So you will equal self dot blobs u. V will be self dot blobs v. Self dot particles equals op dot particles. And if we have not yet given this particles a global op shortcut, I'm going to. And then in our simulated click, we can say op dot particles dot click uv uh, just like that and then in this extension Uh, we can say if channel dot name equals l select, then we will call the method of our project operator simulate click. And then maybe what we can do is then print something uh, using a formatted string clicked particles at and then uh, we can use these brackets uh, to replace what's inside uh, the brackets with a string when it's evaluated so this f means formatted string and then anything inside of these brackets will be replaced with the evaluated value of the variable. So in this case, we'll be dropping in the u-coordinate and the v-coordinate. Um, open up my text port. And let's turn on off to on. And then let's see what happens. Okay, so our clicking is working. We can see that as I'm touching the LiDAR up here. Uh, we are indeed adding stuff uh, to our particles. And this is the great power of using the panel for touch interaction. Um, you can see that just like that, it's super easy for um, it's super easy for us to then use this Python functionality click to add new interactions uh, from basically anywhere in our network uh, at any point. Now, this is going a bit crazy right now, and that's because we don't clear our table on Pulse yet. Um, we only clear the table if we have a... Uh, a right select on the viewer. That our select is here. Um, so how can we fix that? We can use our parent parameter, a, par a parameter cop to grab our parent parameters, use the reset parameter, and then just use a simple math, add these chops, and then redrop that on our chop execute. The 
This is our extension for this. Uh, okay, cool. So now, look at our viewer, add some stuff, and then press the one key, and voila. Now it's time to sort out the mapping, because it's annoying me. Um, so if we look at our geo, we can see that our uh, bounds on the X are like roughly, let's say minus 2.5 to minus 2.5 or minus two to minus two, something like that. And our Y is like about the same. Now we have these two maths. This will be uh, scale t x, and this is scale t y. Um, our math, our scale t x looks about right. Um, I'll make this circle radius a little bit smaller. And we can see, it's like very hard to see. Um, yeah, there it is. So it's it's just all all wrong at the moment. Um, like I'm tapping here, and you can see the circle appearing everywhere else. And I believe the reason for that is because we're not scaling uh, the Y coordinates appropriately. So one, <laughs> the range was from minus two to two, but then we need to multiply this by uh, our aspect ratio. So I know that happens to be uh, resolution one, not resolution X, and parent.p.par.resolution. And now we're scaling this range by our aspect ratio. Um, this parent.p, by the way, is referencing this parent shortcut, which is handy because if I then collapse this, uh, the references are not broken. So let's see if that looks any better. It's looking a lot better, actually, immediately a lot better, which is great. And now you can already see that we have our touch for attractors is working, working nicely. Okay. That's good. Um, but maybe, I mean, I really like that click and drag, right? This like kind of having the particles seek the touch, which still works uh, if the mouse is doing it, but it doesn't work if we try and click and drag the LiDAR. Let's take a look at why that might be. So again, getting everything open to try and troubleshoot. If this is our LiDAR and this is our mouse, when we click and drag on the mouse, that L select stays down the entire time. Um, and that is the same that happens when we click and drag on the LiDAR, but our click is only happening on off to on. And we don't really want to click at like every X, Y point during a drag either, because that's going to result in tons and tons of points, which are going to kill our frame rate. So there's actually a pretty simple solution here. Uh, I'm going to add a null. And that simple solution is going to be to simply Grab a select, um, 
grab just the L select. And then I'm going to grab just active. Whoops. Uh, just active from my LiDAR. need these um, okay like that and similarly I'm just gonna wire these both into a map I'm gonna add the chops together and then I'm going to just wire these in to each and this way, all of our functionality should extend. If we just use our LiDAR instead of the mouse. And as we can see now, that as, oops. Okay, not quite working, but still doing something. So our UV isn't moving. If you see that as I'm moving the LiDAR, our UV location for the touch isn't actually moving. So while the selection is staying down and the particle mode is right, um, we're not actually getting that motion. And that motion is coming from this right here, uh, specifically these transforms that are applied to our circle and the surface attractor itself. Fortunately, that's also a pretty easy fix. Uh, we are just going to add an override operator. And what the override operator does is uh, override a channel based on the most recent channel. Okay, that was not super clear. Um, so I'm gonna grab my select LiDAR, I'll just rename. Um, select LiDAR active. I'm gonna copy and paste this. And instead of select LiDAR active, I'll select LiDAR UV, and then I will grab the UV parameters, and I'm not going to rename them. I'll wire this into the bottom of the override, and I'll match on channel name. And now you can see that when my mouse is moving, this override chop is, is updating based on my mouse, and when my LiDAR is moving, this override chop is being based on my LiDAR. So I'll wire that in and from here, I believe that we should actually have particles that do indeed follow our LiDAR touches in addition to having the touches themselves form attractors um, and then, you know, can add additional attractors with more touches. So I don't really love this like crazy meta ball looking thing. So we can either reduce the weight on the meta balls by like a lot and make this a more reasonable level of attraction or even repulsion, depending. Um, which is kind of interesting, but again, not, not really what I want. Um, so I'm actually going to disconnect this or yeah, I'm just going to disconnect this and disconnect that. And then also very simple, 
what I'll do is just take this dat2, that is a list of the points that our touches are generating, and just wire this dat directly into my particle seed. And now, our clicks are actually um, being added as points, which are then sources for our particles. And a click and drag still allows you to see the particles like that. Or uh, sorry, have the follow particles follow the mouse. If we reset, we can see if it works with LiDAR as well. And it does appear to. One thing I don't really like is the trail on that uh, tracker, uh, the this circle that is tracking our mouse. So I'm going to add a render pass. And this first render will do just Geo 1. And this second render will do just Geo 2. And we'll clear the camera. And then that does have feedback, but this render pass doesn't, and we will add it with a simple over. And actually like that. And so now we can see our trail, or our, um, our touch, but we don't have the bad feedback trails. Which is lovely. Um, so now we have a system where users can touch the screen at different places and create particle sources and then also use hands or any other type of multi-touch um, to interact with these particle systems. The functionality itself, again, the particle stop and the LiDAR is not groundbreaking, um, but hopefully the full kind of project structure um, going from setting up all of our infrastructure, making sure that our extension is carrying out the Python functionality, using a perform comp, having all of our operators externalized and up on GitHub. Hopefully all of that was helpful to see in practice and um, can form a basis for putting together a more complicated systems and projects in the future. So before I go, I'm going to come back to this page. Um, okay, so 1016, I'm gonna save all of our stuff again. Boom, 1023, all of that is now updated. We can see that our LiDAR particle extension uh, was last saved at 10.38. It automatically saves, so I know that VS Code is saving it for me, but good to check anyway. Um, and then what we can do is just add another commit to our GitHub. So I'll commit and then I'll use a message, finish tutorial. Ah, I forgot to add my everything uh, to the commit. There we go. And then I can push to my master again. see all of this is updated immediately and yeah 
now we have a nicely set up GitHub that's tracking all of our, our different toxes, um, which is a very good basis from which to build more complex functionality. Um, Yeah, so with that, I believe that is the end of this tutorial. Um, again, hopefully everybody found some value in seeing kind of how everything comes together. And again, before I go, just thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters. It means a lot to me, and I really can't say thank you enough. Until next time.